we'll start with the prayers vasudevasutam devam kamsa chaadura marthanam devaki paramanandam krishnam vande jagat gurum we have come to the 11th chapter of the bhagavad gita which is entitled vishva roopa darshana yoga a quick backdrop as to where we stand in our study so far what we have seen is the nature of the lord from chapter 7 to chapter 10 the most important point we should remember is whenever we are discussing or understanding what is the nature of the power in this world two things we should keep in mind what my eyes can see what i my sense organs can perceive is the world what my sense organs cannot perceive is the pure consciousness the pure awareness and if i have some power to think to do things obviously the person who has created this entire universe or manifested this whole universe has got a much much more higher power we see so many things in this world which are not in our, under our control at all so we 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 assume that there is a higher power which my eyes cannot see normally whenever we say the lord there are three types of the lord which we know the one which we try to see in an idol is the manusham version of the lord that means we see the lord as shiva lord as uh, krishna lord as uh, uh, devi and so on that is the same human form we try to see the lord then there is a second form in which we are we we are we are uh, told in the puranas is the form of lord vishnu with four hands normal lord is will be like i like us like lord krishna with two hands but lord vishnu has got four hands and he has got the power now here in this chapter the same lord is described as the entire cosmos hence this chapter is called as vishva roopa vishva means the cosmos roopa means the form darshana means the vision so when we see the entire cosmos we must understand we are going to see both creation as well as destruction they are all complementary pairs in this creation there is a purpose of creation and that requires a complementary birth and death creation and dissolution so that power the power of the lord is this creative ability and the destructive ability both are the powers of the lord that is what you will see in this chapter and in order to have the right vision of what this universe is we must understand both both the aspects of this vision so this 
nature of the Lord we have studied so far is Chaitanya Sarupa. Chaitanya means pure awareness, consciousness. They are just very simple words, but they have a tremendous power in them. They have the cosmic Jnana Shakti. That means the knowledge which exists in the entire universe. I'm saying awareness principle, but to me, awareness principle may be very, very limited because of my mind and my body and my sense organs. We are able to visualize only a small portion of that the, of that uh, uh, massive uh, force which is available in this universe. So that awareness consciousness principle has got three shaktis. Jnana shakti, Icha shakti and Kriya shakti. Like we also have the power to know, the power to desire and the power to do things. So whenever we look at that power of the Lord to do, that is the Kriya Shakti, under that Kriya Shakti, there is Srishti, Stiti and Layam. Srishti means creation, Stiti means maintenance and Layam means dissolution. So broadly speaking, when we say the Lord, we should imagine that like me, there is a supreme power which is able to create so many things, which is able to maintain them and which is also able to dissolve them. This should be the vision of the whole creation. And in the last chapter, we studied Vibhutis. Chapter 10 was called as Vibhuti Yoga. In this chapter, the Lord said that I hold the entire creation with a very small part of myself. In verse number 42 of chapter 10, Athava bahu tena Kim nyate na tuvarjuna vishtam dhya ahamidam krishnam kaangshe eka kaangshe na sthitho jagat. Eka kaangsha, that means in one small portion, that means if massive, the Lord is with form and without form, he says in one small portion, I have this creation. I hold the entire creation. And he said that the world is manifested in me and Arjuna wanted to see that vibhuti of the Lord, how I can show me the entire vibhuti, show me your glory, asked Arjuna in chapter 10. So what was depicted was many in one. That means the entire Vibhuti has come from one Lord, all the glories. In this chapter, Arjuna is asking a question to Lord Krishna and says, okay, I'm seeing you right in front of me. Can you show the entire creation in you, in your form? In your Krishna form, can I see this entire world? In the last chapter, you told me you are the glory of the entire universe. You are the entire universe. So here, the Lord tries to show Arjuna his entire cosmic form in his own form, in his own, in his, in his own self, right? as a human form, he showed to Arjuna through a divine eye, which he blessed Arjuna with, he showed his entire creation. So 
so here we see many in one many in one was chapter 10 one in many is chapter 11 that means in one lord in one consciousness we can we should be able to see the entire creation and the last chapter was the whole creation is coming in from this one principle called as consciousness when we try to understand these two chapters in our own mind what happens is we get that vision of what is manifestation what is unmanifestation which goes on in this entire universe which is beyond our control it is happening but we didn't know that that is what is happening in the universe that we come to know only when we do the spiritual study that there is a principle called as manifestation unmanifestation which is what we experience as waking dream sleep waking dream sleep in the higher text of upanishads we study what is this nature of consciousness how this whole manifestation takes place how unmanifestation takes place in my Wednesday class of uh, Dakshna Murti Stotram, that is what we are studying. Th that is at a higher level. What is the nature of this consciousness? In chapter nine, 9 of the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord said, the, if you look at, if you remember the fourth and the fifth verse, the most trickiest verse of the Bhagavad Gita, he said, all beings exist in me, but I am independent of the world so this is how we have studied the Gita so far that there is a principle called as awareness consciousness principle which is the real nature of this jiva which is real nature of me and it is this it is the same awareness consciousness principle which is the nature of the entire universe which we see before us. Entire universe. It is, it is existing in that consciousness. It is coming, the whole cosmos is coming from that consciousness. If you, if you try to imagine that in our sleep state, it is the unmanifest state of the universe. In our waking state is the entire manifestation of the universe. If you ask the question, who was I in my sleep state? What was my nature? Then you can get a sort of a glimpse of this pure awareness consciousness because from there only the entire waking state comes. Again, the waking state dissolves into that principle, which is called as Satchid Ananda or that pure awareness. So here we are studying that pure awareness in the cosmic form, in the manifested form. In the, this chapter, now this is the background of the Bhagavad Gita to enter into chapter 11. Now, as usual, this chapter consists of 55 verses as shown in the chart here before you. These 55 verses are broadly classified into three portions or four portions. If, if you want to look at the uh, entire chart, if you see, Verse 1 to 4 is Arjuna's desire to see Vishwarupa. So what Arjuna does is, in these four verses, he summarizes the entire teaching, what he has had so far. And what he tells the Bhagwan, you see, this is the, this is the beauty of a student. He should be able to tell the Guru that, oh, I have studied so much. Tell me what is beyond now. He should be able to recollect what he has studied. So here in these, Arjuna being a great student, a Sishya, he says, I know that I am not the ego. 
this doership in me is a delusion i am the pure self this much i have learned so far in the bhagavad gita and there is this uh, what is the nature of pure consciousness i have learned in chapter 2 i have learned na jayate mriyate va karachit that means this consciousness is never born it never dies but the body is born body dies this consciousness cannot be burned the five elements cannot touch this consciousness this consciousness is eternal it is permanent that is the what arjuna has learned so far and then he said i have learned from chapter 7 to 9 that this consciousness is where from where this whole world arises and the whole world dissolves and in each one of us this consciousness is there just like the wave comes from water and goes back to water similarly each one of us the living being is compared to a wave we all come from that pure consciousness or awareness or we call it god and we go back to the same one principle which is that awareness and this awareness is there in each one of us as the antaryami antaryami means it is hidden in the mind of all of us as the sakshi as the witness of the mind as the illuminator of the mind throughout our life if you want to know where is god you should just look at your own mind and you will discover the lord as the witness as the illuminating principle as the light principle which illumines the thoughts and this light principle has no decay it is the cause of this entire functioning of the universe so this is the nature of that pure consciousness and it is that consciousness which is appearing as the entire universe so from verse 5 to 8 mainly krishna starts giving to arjuna the divya chakshu divya chakshu means he gives see if we want to see the cosmic vision with our normal eyes we will not be able to see because we have the ego in us i the ego is the limiting factor and the i the ego has got iness and is also called mindness i i belong to the world i am in the world so if we drop this ahamkara and mamakara then we will be able to have the same vision of that ishwara without this mind the if i if i if i don't have this ahamkara or the mamakara i will have the same vision because i don't have the wheeling of that nature of bhagwan nature of that supreme power i don't have that veiling anymore i will be able to see i can live in this whole universe as a jeevan mukta as a free person so here lord krishna gives the divya chakshu i will explain that when we go to that verse and through this vision we come to know what is who is this krishna his form what is the nature and how he can withdraw the entire universe into himself that means we see the manifestation and the unmanifestation from that pure consciousness principle which we call it as god 
this is a fundamental uh, teaching which we should understand in the spiritual study. This is very, very important because once you understand that there is a principle which is happening in the universe of some manifestation, unmanifestation, again manifestation, again the waking comes up, again the uh, uh, sleep comes up. Waking dream sleep, waking dream sleep is the manifestation, unmanifestation of that power, which is called as Satchit Ananda, that which is called as Brahman, which is called as the Lord Krishna. Here we have the description of the vision, cosmic vision from Sanjaya and also from Arjuna. If you recall in chapter one, Sanjaya was a commentator to Dhritarashtra, King Dhritarashtra. So he also has the, co the cause, he also gets the Divya Chakshu to say and to know what Arjuna saw. So we find Sanjaya's narration. Sanjaya comes in three chapters, chapter one, chapter 11, and chapter 18, he comes back again. So here from nine to 13 and 35 to 50 is Sanjaya's version of the Vishwarupa. Arjuna, what did he see? That is described in three different ways. When somebody sees the entire cosmic, cosmic vision, there will be these three emotions. The first emotion will be of Vismaya. Vismaya means you, you are absolutely spellbound, dumbstruck, awestruck with a wonder. Your hairs will spring up in horripilation because you see the vastness, you see the variety, you see the beauty, you see the effulgence in this entire creation. Imagine you can see the entire cosmos, so many suns, you know, in, when you study the astrology, there are thousands of suns in this cosmos. So many stars, so many, I mean, it's, it's uh, indescribable, this universe is infinite. So the first vision is Vismaya. Vismaya means wonder. What happens, the second is, the second emotion which strikes you is Bhayam, fear. Because you see almost everything in creation. So the, in here what the Lord shows is, He shows everything. And in, within us, within uh, a space where the time and space is compressed and you see the variety. That is what Arjuna saw and that gave him the bhayam, the fear. Then what happens is because of fear, Arjuna then bows and in bhakti, the third emotion which Arjuna had was devotion. So from wonder to fear, to devotion and to requesting Lord, I don't want to see your form anymore you give me back your normal form. That is what Arjuna says in the end. In the 36th verse, he says, I want to see your, your simple form or like the vision of Lord Vishnu. And then Bhagwan comes back and removes his Divya Chakshu. And then that is how the chapter ends. So these are 55 beautiful verses. When you uh, try to understand, when you try to uh, learn the Gita, this, this particular chapter is a very, very dramatic chapter. It's full of variety, full of excitement, full, especially when somebody wants to show this in a TV, then they will pictureize this particular chapter 11. And 
this also teaches us the nature of the lord of both being manifest as well as unmanifest in order to have the same vision we have to empty ourselves we have to remove the ego in us once we remove this ego i notion from the mind what happens is we are able to see the lord's function of this entire universe and then the last verse is an indication the 55th verse will introduce to us to be a bhakta ultimately lord says if you be a bhakta of mine he gives five qualities of a bhakta and this 55th verse becomes the seed verse for chapter 12 in this chapter there are two verses which are important the first verse which is important is chapter is verse number 18 and the second verse is 30 33 i will try to see if i can explain these two verses in the end of the presentation now we will get into the the uh, actual uh, chapter three stages of understanding god the first is ekarupa ekarupa means one form i see lord as ishta devata ishta devata means i am a bhakta of vishnu or shiva or krishna or devi they are all human personalities i go to a temple i talk to the lord he relieves my mind relieves my problems he is the karma phala data i get the benefit of praying to that lord with form and vishnu sarsnamam has got the dhyana shloka which you all know you have chanted so many times so you can meditate on that form in the bhagavad gita this ekarupa is not emphasized much aneka rupa means we see the the lord as the world that is what is being said in this chapter i see the form of the lord as the deities as the human as the plant as the rivers we saw in the last one in the last chapter 10 all are the bhutis of the same one principle which is the lord consciousness principle in the realm of time and space this happens it's through the time and space this manifestation and manifestation happens so gita emphasizes this vision in this chapter 11 god appearing as the entire creation like the gold appears as the ornaments we have seen in chapter 7 the verse matha parataram nanyat kinchidasti dhananjaya mai sarva vidam proktam sutre mani gana eva very beautiful verse of the seventh chapter the lord in the form of consciousness awareness is teaching arjuna and he is saying that this whole creation is strung in me as the awareness principle as the consciousness principle if you look at the core of our personalities we will also discover that my nature is this pure observation or pure i am a pure observer i am a conscious being i am a pure being that is what you will discover when you 
dive deep into your personality. You drop all the emotions, drop all the thoughts, drop the physical body, you will end up in this same core principle, which is called as consciousness. And beyond that, that consciousness appears as this body appears as this mind in the waking state, but it has got another form, which is the Arupa form. Arupa means formless nature. Beyond time and space, there is no time, there is no space in pure being. In pure consciousness, there is no body. Kathopanishad says, Ashabdam, Asparsham, Arupam, Agandham. That means the five sense organs are not in consciousness. That is what he said, Lord Krishna said in chapter 9, 4 and 5. I am not in them. So, what is creation? In Brahadhanika Upanishad, they say that creation is Murtha Amurtha, Prapancha. That means creation consists of with form of body, five elements, Agni, Jalam and Prithvi and so on and Amurtha. Amurtha means formless. Like air, space is formless. So out of the five elements, you can't, you can feel the air, but you can't see the air. You can know that space exists because everything exists in space but you cannot see space. See space means as an element. Space function is we see that it can accommodate the entire universe. That's what we all see through the, our eyes. But actual space is beyond the perception of the eyes. And this consciousness lies beyond space. It's beyond our three waking states. Waking, dream, sleep, beyond our three states of the mind is this consciousness. That is what is called as the arupa, the formless nature. That we are going to study in chapter 13, 14 and 15 of the Bhagavad Gita. In this chapter, we are doing aneka vishwa rupa ishvara. So one consciousness exists as this entire universe is our study today. Kathopanishad, I was referring to this particular mantra here. And this is the one which says that this pure Atma is without sound, without touch, without form, without decay, without taste, without smell, without a beginning, without end. And it is eternal and unchanging. Very important is unchanging. The Lord of Death taught an eight-year-old boy called Nachiketa in Katho Upanishad. I will be taking this Upanishad in about four or five months time. This is the central verse of that Upanishad, the central verse. And there also the same consciousness awareness is, this is described as something which our eye, which our five senses cannot perceive. So this is the faith we should have in the scriptures that I am trying to understand something. I'm trying to discover my own nature which is without this form of this body. It exists. I exist without form. How do I know this? Through the Katho Upanishad, which clearly says, I, there is consciousness principle, which is without the, the five sense organs and what they can perceive. So if I want to have the vision of the world, I can see it as a pair of opposites or I can see it as complementary pairs. If I see it with my own two eyes, the, the fleshy eyes, it will be the pair of opposites. 
that is called as jiva drishti it is a purely private selfish short sighted vision and it is the cause of all our problems and it is a partial view this is what we need to drop we need to drop our vision of the world as a pair of opposites and come to see the world as complementary pairs birth and death is complementary suppose everybody was living for thousands of years then this world will be totally different so it the lord has created the world in such a way that we are all here for a short time we experience the world again we come back to the world with a new body that is what is seen by divya chakshu so chapter 11 shows there are certain favorable situations in life there are certain unfavorable situations also which we experience in life everything has is valid it has a purpose life has a purpose death has a purpose because it gives us a new body that is what is called as ishvara drishti seeing complementary as a part of creation having a uniform view of the world if one is removed from this ahamkara then the totality is possible i have to drop this individuality learn to drop the ego i the selfish i the short sighted i and see the totality we need to have this ahamkara and mamakara to go through the activities in our life i need to go through there are two aspects when i try to study the spiritual aspect of the world then this aham and mamam mamakara has to be dropped when i am in the world acting doing my duty i should use the aham and mama this these two aspects we must be very clear when we are acting use your aham and mamakara and do the best possible action from the body excel in all activities be it in college be in office be at home anywhere we have to work with our sense organs and use them in the world to perform duty but when it comes to seeing and asking the question who am i what is this world you wear the divya chakshu which is the vision which arjuna also had when you want to analyze the world wear this vision without the aham and mama then you start seeing the world then you will see that the world consists of form and the formless because both are possible the moment you unwind your aham and mama you will be able to see this entire manifestation and manifestation in one awareness principle it is possible that is why this chapter is teaching us how to have that vision and in chapter 13 14 15 we are going to see how to discriminate between the pure consciousness and the rest of the world kshetram and kshetragnya we are going to see that later but here we must understand the nature of that consciousness as the whole universe then as i said before verse 2 bhava vyahi hi bhutana shrutav vistai rasho maya twatthak kamala patraksha mahatyam api chavyaham 
that is what arjuna says i have understood you are the material cause you are the intelligent cause you are the srishti stiti laya karana you alone are appearing as the world now he says i wish to see you your form o purushottama in the third verse he says drishtam ichhami te rupam aishwara purushottama you are the universe universe is you o lord show me this form in you you are standing before me show me show me this entire cosmos i can't see the cosmos cosmos with this your whole vibhuti which you explained in chapter 10 chapter 10 show it to me in your form natumam shakya se drishtam anenaiva sachu chakshusha divyam dadami te chakshu pashyame yoga maishwaram in the eighth verse the lord says you cannot see through your normal fleshy eyes the entire divine vision i will give you a divine eye so arjuna gets the divya chakshu and then he starts seeing the entire cosmos so the first description in the 11th chapter he is from sanjaya anek vaktana nayanam aneka darshanam aneka divya bharanam divya nekot datyudham so here now sanjaya says now you see see the vision of the lord he is all the mouths all the year all the years all the wonderful sights he has got divine ornaments he's got see there are 14 lokas when you go to swarga loka you can see divine ornaments what you see here is nothing the golden ornaments here is very very different than what you would get in heaven now he is arjuna is being shown the the heavenly ornaments the divine weapons nobody has seen these before that is what sanjaya is telling dhritarashtra and it starts with creation vishwarupa starts with creation how did the creation come about and then it ends with pralayam where everything resolves the sun the moon are the eyes of the lord the ears are the 10 directions the earth is the feet of the lord vayu the prana of the lord now this is a divine manifestation which is available to us all the time if we try to understand that this is the vision of the universe that cosmic being is in this world in this way that is what we also learn in purusha sukta the same same divinity is expressed there also then what happens when we have this vision we have develop a reverence to this creation so that we see the lord's manifestation means we are trying to divinize this whole creation as one cosmos as one cosmic being and that comes to us by the study of the bhagavad gita these are the verses they are used for contemplation and we can invoke that bhakti in us and see the same supreme power it helps me when i contemplate on this cosmic form it helps me to get rid of my own raga dvesha my likes and that dislikes this are there in our mind i like certain things i don't like certain things this is my personal view whereas the ishwara view is the entire creation when i try to appreciate what is that lord or ishwara and what is his glory then what happens is my own raga and dvesha comes down i am not so much bothered about my own small petty things because anyway these are all small small things which we 
uh, like this life and they last for certain time and then it will go away. So the Divya Chakshu is basically a removal of the private vision, the Jiva Srishti and seeing the entire creation as Ishvara Srishti. Vishvato Mukham. We see the Virat Bhakta. That means I am a Bhakta of the Lord in the Virat form, in the cosmic form. As I said, the same thing is mentioned in the Purusha Suttam also. And so he, Arjuna removes his likes and dislikes and then he sees the world of, he sees the world objectively as pure consciousness awareness. So he goes through these three emotion, uh, emotions. The wonder and beauty is expressed in verse 11, 12, 17 and 21. We have seen some of, we'll, we will see some of these verses. Then the fear will come and then the surrender comes. Divya malam paradaram divya gandhanu lepanam sarvascharyamayam devam anantam vishvato mukham. Here what the Lord says, he shows him the divine garlands, the necklaces, the, the dresses which they are wearing in the, in, the, in the swarga. He shows the swarga first. That there is a heaven in which you can see all this. Different perfumes, cosmetics, which are, which are never seen in this earth, but the, you have got that type of fragrances. Aneka Vatra Nayanam, Aneka Adbhuta Darshanam, Aneka Divyam Bharanam, Divyu Nath Neko Dhatudam. So he sees wonderful sights, wonderful forms, and comes out with the the uh, beauty of this cosmic vision. Here in this verse, number 12, he says there are thousands of sun, as if thousands of suns are setting ablaze at one time in the sky. This is the vision which Arjuna saw. Because in according to the Vedic uh, literature, there are thousands of sun in this cosmic uh, world. So he saw the entire splendor of the what we see in uh, from the earth is one sun the effulgence of one sun you can imagine what arjuna would have seen thousands of sun arising at the same time then the lord showed him his form kiritinam gadinam chakrahasta all the his his you know this is the vishnu's form with the radiance at the background Then he show, showed him all the rishis praying in praise of the Lord. He showed him the entire cosmos, the earth, ocean is two thirds of the earth. Earth is only one third portion. That means the covered area of what we see is only one third. Two third is ocean. You can imagine what was the, how the whole cosmos would look at. The inter, the, our intellect expands and then it disappears into this vision. The moment we see this beauty of this creation in these verses, I'm going to send you the actual notes verse by verse of all these verses. If you read through the notes, you will you will, you will get the depth of the descriptions of this vision of beauty. Then Arjuna saw the fearful vision and that was he saw the destruction of Dhritarashtra's sons and Bhishma, Drona 
and all the chari all the other people were being destroyed in the battlefield what was happening in the battlefield arjuna saw that he saw, he could see what was happening now and what's going to happen in the future so in the verses 24 to 34 you have the fearful verses where he shows how all the people are dying in this battlefield and there that is what is depicted as the kala tatva the time principle see everything happens in the world if you look at it when does it all driven by time and time is an integral part of the vishwa roopa the whole universe is conditioned by time and space and the time represents the mouth of the lord that is what the lord is teaching arjuna in this chapter he says in one of the verses kalaha aham kalaha i am the kala and in kala in time everything happens birth happens death also happens so time principle has got two sides complementary pairs not opposite pairs if we see it as op opposite pairs we will have fear if we see it as a complementary pair so that death is not fearful but it is something which we need to accept as a part of creation that is what usually happens to all of us when we face death initially for one or two months our mind gets benumbed because we are not able to see the same person for some time but after 3 months 6 months 2 years 1 year 5 years again our mind has accepted it as a part of the it's a fact of life so as a vishwarupa bhakta we should not criticize old age or death then it becomes a lopsided jeeva srishti jeeva vision you are looking it from the body angle our objectivity will go, will go away when we say objectivity means what that is called as ishwara srishti equanimous vision look at a phenomena sub, subjectively that means these are all happening as a fact of life as creation as dissolution it's a total universe so once the individuality comes i comes the body comes then what happens the fear comes in with totality vision death is a blessing because we get a new body lord shiva as the as the uh, lord of death he is a mangala swarupa because he gives us a new body so these are some of the verses which describe the devouring nature of the world the flames represent the time principle where the whole world goes into dissolution at the time of pralaya so arjuna says are you a karuna murti with compassion or are you cannibal because you are eating away the whole universe now in the 32nd verse is where he says that i am the kala principle i am the time principle the time is responsible for birth when the time comes now this time is controlled by the lord it is nothing we have absolutely no control this is where we have to drop our ego and look for some other principle which is called as lord so we need to appreciate that one principle which is that ishwara and take it as his glory see the summer and winter as complementary samyoga and vyoga birth and death growth and decay both are in this universe 
Our prarabdha karma for Bhishma and Drona was over and therefore Arjuna saw his own teacher getting killed in the battlefield due to Kala Tatvam. Kala is representation of prarabdha karma. Our own karmas make, give us a body to experience. Our own karma gives us another new body. In the 33rd verse, this is one of the verses which I said is important. And in this verse, Tasmad Uttishta Yashod Labaswa Jitva Shatrun Bhunga Rajam Samruddham Maye Vete Nihata Purva Meta Nimitta Matram Bhava Samya Sachin. This Nimitta Matram Bhava Samya Sachin is an important sentence. He tells Arjuna, stand up and obtain the fame, conquer the enemies and enjoy the kingdom. Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna, you are an instrument in my hands. Now, this is a controversial verse. Many students, when they study this when they are very new without studying the 10 chapters, if you come straight to this verse and study this verse, you will find that Lord is controlling everything and I have no control. Because you have not studied the whole Gita up to chapter 10. When you develop a vision that there is a consciousness, there is another principle which is active in this world, then you can understand this Nimitta Matram. Nimitta Matram is with a spiritual view of the world. When you, when you know that there is a higher principle which controls this body to breathe, this body to act, then you will accept that this body is an instrument of the Lord. And what happens then is, then we are puppets in the hand of the Lord, not as an ego. When you see the when you when you see the world with your ego sense, you will you you cannot accept it as a nimitta matra. When you see it as the cosmic view, then you will understand each one of us is just an instrument. In the sense, we come here into the world to enjoy a certain amount of pleasure. And then we go back and get another body. So sometimes when you study these words, the mind will say we have no free will. Everything is determined, everything is not determined by God, but it is predestined. That is what is called as a fatalistic conclusion. Shastra does not accept this at all. In the beginning of Tathobodha lecture itself, the first time when I started teaching the, the uh, spiritual study, in the first text, in the first talk, I have said there are four goals of human life. Purusharthas. If you remember, you will understand Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. The human goal is possible only when you have the free will. So there are two things we should, when we live in the world, we should go as if I have the free will to act and to study spirituality. Uddharet atmanam natmanam avasadet atmaiva atmano bandhu atmaiva rupur atmanaha. In the fifth, in the sixth chapter, verse number five and six, the Lord said, get up, you know, he said, Lift, you should lift yourself by your own self. That means lift yourself, means your lower eye, lift it to the higher eye. The ego eye, lift it to the spiritual eye, the, cosm the consciousness eye, awareness eye. And the same self, that means Banduratma Manastasya Enatmai Vatmana Jitaha. That means win over your mind. And then the mind becomes a friend. 
today the mind you are under control of the mind so mind is controlling you so you need to win over this mind by proper study that is what we are doing so nimitta matram is at a higher level when you have learned to drop the ego you are responsible for your growth destruction you take responsibility in your life don't blame me that's what the lord said my job is not to support the free will but support ideal use of free will sammoham sarva bhuteshu name dveshast na priya ye bhajanti tumam bhaktya mai te teshu chapyaham in the ninth chapter he said that the lord is the same in all beings that means each one of us have the same power to rise and liberate our own self i don't decide anybody's bondage or liberation i am impartial to all a what a devotee chooses he will get whatever we choose if i choose artha and kama i will get artha and kama if i choose moksha as the purushartha i will get moksha so if free will is not accepted following are the logical fallacies which we will get in the instrument theory in the instrument theory what happens i accept everything and no free will but what we should know it is free will is there all karma phalams if there is no free will suppose you say i have no free will everything is decided by lord then what will happen then the bhagwan will become karta and he will become a bigger samsari because he is a karta car is not punished in we know that the driver is punished that means i the ego have to learn to use this body to rise above the ego so second logical problem will come if you accept there is no free will is that bhagwan decides enjoyment and suffering that means he is he is cruel to some people and he is partial another problem is that our life should not have any conflict if there is everything is controlled by the lord but we see our life is full of conflicts so we must understand that we are given a free will to rise also the one more problem is we will not require dharma shastra if there was no free will at all gita study will become redundant so how do we in interpret this nimitta matram we can live we lead a life according to our raga dvesha most of the time when we go through our likes and dislikes we will be going against the god's will if i like as per the dharma as per the shastra that is good suppose i love to sleep till 10 am but the dharma shastra says you get up you sleep early you welcome the sun in the morning that is what is called as leading a life of raga and dvesha what gita is teaching us is lead a life according to dharma what is proper what is improper then you are with the will of the god your will is in alignment with the will of the god that is called as nimitta matra bhishma and drona should die because they have joined the adharma group arjuna is fulfilling bhagwan's will therefore he is aligned to be a nimitta matra that is what lord krishna is saying you your will surrender to me i then you become my nimitta you become lords 
you become a fulfilling instrument for the Lord. So the lesson we learn is we learn to drop our ego and surrender our will to that Lord and then say, okay, Lord, you now you take over my will and say, teach me how to lead my life. That's it. But not lead our life as per my own raga and dvesha. That is the essence of this verse. So when we accept the Lord as the Kala Tattvam, as the time principle, then we can accept birth, death, growth, disease as a fact and go on with the life. The fear of death, you cannot be conquered as long as attachment is there to any body. Bodies are coming and going. Our relationship is always with a body, with a mind. But the body is not permanent. In the first chapter, in the 28th verse, Arjuna's attachment was being shown. Swajanam Krishna. Swajanam, Swajanam. That means if you have attachment, that is the problem of a private vision. Then you cannot have a Vishwarupa Darshan. So essential point coming back as much as possible. In, when you are trying to understand the nature of the world, understand our own existence principle, we need to drop the aham and mama. The I-ness in the body should go away. The minus in the entire creative world of objects and beings should be dropped. And then we come to see what is the Lord wants to show me as the pure consciousness awareness. The third stage in this chapter, as I said, is bhakti. So we have finished two sections, two parts of Arjuna's vision. One is the wonder. The second is the fear. So now the Lord says, I mean, Arjuna says, I am distressed. Show me your previous form in this verse. Number 45, Arjuna wants original Krishna form to be shown to him. Lord removes the Divya Chakshu here. Objectivity goes away. The totality is lost of the lost sight of. That means the, what he saw as the whole cosmos goes away. That is an objective vision. As pure awareness, you and I can also have that vision. When the ahamkara and mamakara is not there, see the world. You are waking up, see the world. The world is going down in, in resolving in sleep, see the world, dissolution. Again, world comes up. This is what happens when we have a divine vision. But all of us are a bundle of raga and dvesha. And in the end, in the last verse, 55th verse, the Lord says, I gave you the Vishwarupa Darshanam because of your devotion to me. You are my bhakta. And bhakti is the greatest sadhana. That's what he says. Bhaktya twananya shakya ahame vido arjuna nyatum drishtum chatvena praveshtum cha parantapa. If you have bhakti, you will make, that will make you more mature and it will transform from eka rupa to aneka rupa. So what makes the difference to us? How do I, how do I transform myself from a one vision of one rupa to aneka rupa is through bhakti. Raga Dvesha will then get reduced. That means through devotion. You will come, you will go beyond the Aneka Rupa and then you will see the Chaitanya Arupa. That is what will be shown to us in chapter 13.
when you recognize that Ishvara, you will no more stand as separate one. The ego will be dropped. Very important lesson. I notion as it was said in Sat Darshanam by Ramana Maharishi. He said, for those who are listening to me now, if you have attended my Sat Darshanam class, you remember, I notion is Ahamkara Mamakara. If that gets dropped from this body, what happens is you are the Nimitta Mataram. You will recognize I am always with the Lord. Lord's form is consciousness. You will be merged in that consciousness as one with that Arupa Lord. Matkarma, matkarma Krit Matparamo this is the last verse of chapter 11. Convert your life into worship and keep God as the goal. Dharma Artha Kama should become subservient, subservient principles, goals. Certainly you will come to me, says the Lord. There are five, there are five uh, qualities which are mentioned here of a bhakta. And what he says is that you develop these qualities and you will reach me. And what are these qualities of the bhakta? And these qualities, number one, mat karma krita. Yaha, the first one. Mat karma krita means you do actions for me. Which means karma yoga. Mat paramaha yaha. Mat paraha. Mat paraha means look at me. That means look at pure awareness, consciousness, the Lord as the supreme. This is the bhakti. How to develop this bhakti? This is what is the seed verse for the next chapter. Chapter 12, which we'll take up next week. This is the seed verse. Mad bhakta mad chittaha. That means mad bhakta means one who is devoted to me, one who is devoted to this consciousness principle as the Lord, which is expressing as this whole universe. Sangha varjitaha. That is the fourth one. Detachment. I, I have detachment towards the entire creation, entire basically detachment to the body and mind. Nirvaira sarva bhuteshu yaha, without enmity towards anyone. That means love for everybody. So these are the five qualities which of a bhakta which is mentioned here. And uh, this is the seed words for developing bhakti. So chapter 12 will be expanding this portion of 55th verse. I told you this, there is an important verse 18, verse number 18. Tomaksharam paramam veditavyam tomasya vishvasya param nidhanam tomasya shashvatasya Dharma Gopta Sanatana Swam Purusho Matome. Now this description is of the Lord here, which is the formless nature. What is he? What is he as a formless God? Tom Aksharam Purusham Viditavyam. That means you are the pure consciousness which is imperishable. Paramam, you are the supreme. Everything else in the world is perishable. The physical world, the mental world, the causal world, the verbal world, everything is perishable. What is imperishable is only one thing, which is awareness principle, the consciousness principle. So this is a very important verse, which tells us that the Lord has got two forms. One is in the form of the universe. The second is a 
formless nature, which is the pure consciousness. I also have the same nature with form, body and mind, without form, pure consciousness. My pure consciousness and the Lord's pure consciousness is one. They merge together in sleep state and they remain as one. I am that pure formless awareness. This is what is called as Tattvam Asi. Asi is this pure consciousness. We are one. This is the ultimate lesson which the Lord wants to teach us in the entire Bhagavad Gita. See my form as the universe and behind this form there is a formless. See your form as the, uh, as the body and mind. Behind that form is the formless. So the 18th verse is a very critical verse, very important verse in the 11th chapter and very important for us to remember this verse and as pure consciousness, what does he do? So as pure consciousness, he is the, sorry. You are that Purusha, Paramam, Supreme Purusha, which is described in the Upanishads, which it says, Atma Vare Drishtavya, Drishtavyaha in Brahmanic Upanishad, there is a sentence in this verse in the end which says, You must see this. Drishtavya means understand this. Here, in this, here you'll see Drishtavyaha, Shrotavyaha, Mantavyaha. Three words. These are the teachings which tells us you must understand. This consciousness, Shrotabhyaha, you must listen to what this consciousness is. Mantabhyaha, you should reflect on this consciousness. Very important. This is very often quoted verse of the Brahmanic Upanishad. And this is from where the actual process of learning the spiritual study comes out. Shravanam, Mananam, Nididhyasram. It comes from this verse of the Brahmanic Upanishad. So in this verse number 18, the Lord Krishna teaches us his nature is formless. So this is where it says in the end, should be heard, reflected, meditated upon. This comes in Brahadhanaka chapter 2, 4 and 5. This is the Pramanam. This is the proof. Then the description of in the same Brahadhanic Upanishad, it tells us that this pure consciousness or Bhagavan is in the nature of Saupadika and Nurupadika. So Upadika means as with Upadi of the universe. Like we have the Upadi of the body and mind, Lord has the entire Upadi of the universe. Nirupadika means without the Upadi. Like I without my body and mind in sleep state is called as Nirupadika. Similarly, the Lord without the whole cosmos is Nirupadika. And that Nirupadika is what is called as pure form, which is called as Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. We'll be studying this. This is where the focus after Gita is over. This portion, Nirupadika, is what is stressed in all the Upanishads. Just now I told you about Katha Upanishad where it said ashabdam asparsham arupam without the senses you are formless that is how the upanishad focuses on nirupadikam it's important for us because this is where this is how we should understand the real study benefits us in this way tomasya vishvasya param nidhanam the word here nidhanam is very important 
Nidhanam means what is the substratum? For all the objects in the world, the resting place, they all get converted to ashes. For the ashes, they are the resting place is the earth. For the, for the five elements, the earth, for the uh, earth is one of the elements. For the five elements, the resting place is the three gunas. We are going to study the three gunas in chapter 14. And the three gunas are a part of Maya. That means Prakriti nature. And this nature is where it is in Brahman. It is in Brahman means pure consciousness. That is why when we study gunas, gunas means sattva, rajas and tamas. This is what is known as from where the five elements have come. I will we'll go, we'll study more of this, but I'm trying to explain the meaning of nidhanam here. Nidhanam in this verse is, means that this formless nature is from where this gunas come, from where this entire five elements come and the entire world comes. The sattva guna produces the mind. We have studied this in Tathobodha. The jnana indriyas, that means the power of seeing, hearing and all is from sattva guna. Rajoguna produces the karma indriyas. The prana is all from the rajoguna of that maya. And the tamoguna is the responsible for the entire inert world. The stone, the wall, all the desk, these are all inert. They don't have a mind. That is all coming from the tamas aspect of the gunas. So here, uh, uh, what is important is that we are pure consciousness in our nir upadika state. That means without the, in the, in our own formless nature, we are this pure consciousness. And that is the nidhanam, that is the substratum from where the entire world comes, the body, mind are perceived. So Bhagwan is also Shuddha Chaitanyam and he is also in the form of form Jagat Adharaha. That means the substratum of the entire creation. Upadeshya Sara also talks about very similar uh, 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 similar topic here about the nature of the God, nature of the uh, God without form. Karturatnya prapyate phalam karma kim param karma tachadam. That means formed, karma means action. That is only inert. But the one behind that is the consciousness principle, which is the sentient principle. Okay, these are the other verses. I won't go into the depth of these. These are just for you to, uh, these are there in the notes, which I'll be circulating. And uh, you can go through these verses uh, in depth if you want to study the chapter 11. Uh, these are the verses. Even for Nimitta Matram, there are some notes. These are the notes you will see in the uh, notes which I'm circulating. Uh, if you want to go understand the free will and because these, this particular verse, the Lord, students have some confusion here. If you go through these uh, notes, you will get uh, more clarity of what is Nimitta Matram. So with that, I will close for uh, today. I have also attached here the Vedic vision of God, which is uh, the, the uh, as Artha, Artharti, Jignaso, Jnani, these are all some notes on how we perceive God. You can read through this and uh, uh, understand a little bit more about this vision, cosmic vision of the Lord. Uh, these are additional notes, you see, the, uh, which will help you in the end is the important verses of this, of this chapter. As usual, I have put it here. 
this is this was just a summary what i have given you is a summary of the 11th chapter and the notes which you are getting a detailed notes of 55 verses almost 200 pages again if you want to study the depth of these chapter you can go through those those are beautiful notes uh, these are notes for teaching purposes for the bhagavad gita uh, so if you read through the notes you will be able to understand with this background what i have given you if you go through the notes you will be able to understand if you have any doubts on them you can always send me an email i can have a chat with you so we will close and we'll start the 12th chapter called as bhakti yoga next week uh it's a simple chapter and then we will get uh, the following week probably we'll finish the 12th chapter next week and then after that we will start the important chapters of 13 14 and 15 of the bhagavad gita i'll see how i i will take those chapters so next week will be bhakti yoga the path of devotion with that i will close for the day om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachade purnasya purnamadhaya purnameva vasishade Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om So if there are any questions you may ask them Shanmugam will uh, unmute you Uh, Does anybody have a question uh, in today's uh, presentation? Uh, Shikaji, I have a question. This, uh, you were given the eyes of the Lord, the sun, and all this, right? Eh? Uh, can you repeat the question again, Bauwai? Mm. You get this, uh, the eyes of the Lord is the sun and the moon. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Then the ears is a 10 direction. What 10 direction? 10 direction means the north, south, east, west. They say that the Lord ears, that means he has got such big ears that all, all the whole space, that if you look at the left, it will be his ears. If you look at the right, it will be his ears. So the directions are his ears. That is one of the ways in which they have mentioned, they have visualized the Lord. This is useful if you want to practice in meditation. Suppose you want to practice and you want to see, oh, I want to see the Lord today. So in your own in meditation, you can say the sun, I see the sun every day. So the sun, when I see him, I can close my eyes and say, this is, uh, the Lord is there inside me. I can visualize him as the sun. When the sun is not at night time, you see the moon. That is another luminary. So I, in both, in 24 hours, I'll be able to visualize the Lord all the time. Yeah, uh, is, uh, anything else? Any other question? Sakarji? So, ah, yes, go ahead. Uh, Shakarji, you have told about the free will. <clears throat> yes. The free will is again dominated by our cause and effect and vasanas and all those stuff. Yes. Besides the free will. Correct. So indirectly, there is nothing like free will. Again, it is governed or controlled by our previous births, uh, cause and effect. Exactly. You are understood. That uh, dominated by vasanas. Yes. So within the free will, what is the percentage is really free will and which is already what is the percentage which is already controlled by our 
cause and effect of the earlier births? Oh, that's a good question, but there is no direct answer to this. You see, we will not be able to uh, say give a percentage to that. The, yeah. You see, what we should understand is at any given time, I have a free will. I will use my free will, and I will go decide and discriminate what needs to be done, as per the dharma. As per the dharma, that means as per the right and wrong. Any time, you see, every day, every moment of our life is given to us to use our free will and to and to stabilize our mind. Our why our free will is basically for mind to calm down and then have that vision of that pure awareness consciousness. That is why the free will has been given to us. So. Uh, we, we, uh, how much percentage is coming from our previous vasanas? I have not studied a single scripture which gives us a percentage to that free will. What it says is that we have a possibility to come out of that free will, use the free will, and then drop that free will. There we have a possibility. Where that is what is that pole vaulter, you know, use the pole vaulter to climb up to that spiritual study. Do the shravanam, do the mananam, understand what is this free will which we have. That I factor, I, 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 the ego which is coming again and again in us. Who is that I? What is that I? With spiritual study, when we have this study of the Bhagavad Gita, especially the next two, three chapters, which we'll be doing, you will understand that the free will has, is all, is just a shadow. It is, the free will is only a shadow. In many of the Upanishad, it says it is just a shadow. It appears and disappears. Like the shadow appears and disappears when I walk on the road. Whatever happens to that shadow is not, I'm not, it, nothing happens to me. So the free will, uh, okay, direct answer to your question, is there a percentage? No, there, I, there is no uh, percentage. How much of the free will is coming because of my vasanas? Uh, see, uh, this free will is also of three types. Sattvic free will, Rajasic free will, and Tamasic. In the 18th chapter, we will, we will go into the depth of this, but our objective should be to make this free will more sattvic. Uh, 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 are you getting it? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, Shakaji. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you so much. Very good. Very good question. Thank you. Okay. Shikaji, I got one more question, Shikaji. Can... Ah, bolo, bolo. Yes, go ahead. See, as you were saying that everything is not determined by God. Okay. So, is it a predetermined or determined something like that of the karma? You see, karma, karma? Okay. Uh, uh, is, uh, what you are asking is um, do we, okay, karma and karma phalam. They are two separate things when you are talking it from the body angle. So when you're looking at your body and you see your body acting, you are performing an action. You're using free will to perform an action. With reference to the body, there is a free will, there is a karma, there is a karma phala. So from the body angle, always you should understand the free will exists. But from the spiritual angle, when you look at it from the consciousness angle, then you have a different vision. Then you will say that all bodies which I see are nothing else. They are all acting. They are all acting as per the, because this free will is there, is given to us. The body is given to us. Everything is given to us by Ishwara. So therefore, we can say from another angle, if you, if you have the vision of the Lord as the controller of the body itself, then you can say that I am the nimitta matram. I am the instrument of the Lord. 
I will do as per the, as per what the Lord wants me to do every day. Then your ego slowly comes down. Now this will, you will get only after study of Bhagavad Gita. When you know that there is a higher principle which controls the whole universe, definitely I'm a part of this universe. If you take yourself away from that universe, then your free will starts. But suppose you dissolve your free will into the cosmos, then it is the, your, you become the instrument of the entire creator. So, this, so we must learn how to use the free will in our normal day-to-day -day life. At the same time, through this chapter 11, we must learn, surrender the free will and say, now, oh Lord, teach me who you are. Teach me my own Swarupam. If you say this in meditation, what will happen is that pure consciousness will become evident to you. That's it. That is the palam. That is what happens when we, when we are using and dropping the free will. So you, 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 we have to decide whether it is a good free will or a bad free will. No, don't, don't, don't go into too much of depth of under, trying to discover this free will. Is it going to be good, bad? Drop all that. Just do your duty every day. Don't don't analyze the free will too much because ultimately it is Maya. You will not come to any conclusion about what is this free will because it is disappears. Mm -hmm. It will disappear the moment you question the free will. It will disappear. So don't analyze this free will too much. Draw, learn to do your duty, and a time will come. Keep uh, be on the spiritual path you automatically will understand how to drop this free will. So just forget the free will. Forget it. Forget the free will <laughs> part. Just to do your duty. I have to do my duty. Whatever I have to do, I do my duty in the best possible way. Yeah. As yeah. a mother, as a father, as a grandfather, just your duty. This, use your free will to, you, to perform duty. Why free will? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Shekhar, I have something to ask you. Yeah, Chandra. You see, uh, this is a, not partly uh, this chapter, but I want to get your opinion uh, from the chief aspect of memory, the memory of past experiences and awareness preserve principle of the consciousness they come from the mind or the intellect? You mean the past experiences? Past experiences. Because when you are meditating, you see all the relevant, unrelevant uh, uh, issues start coming in, you see. Yes. So, and then at the same time, uh, you, the awareness principle is there. But from which, which angle is it coming from? Mind or the intellect? The... Okay, very, very good question because you are a very, very deep thinker. I'm sure you have done so much of meditation. Otherwise, you won't ask this question. Okay. Uh, answer to a question is all whatever we get as thoughts in our mind mm -hmm. when we are sitting in meditation, all the thoughts are nothing else but memories. Oh. All. Because whatever you are thinking, now this, what I'm telling you is explained in Vichara Sagara. Oh. There is a, the same question has been asked in, by the student there. And the question there was, what do we, how do we experience our dream? Is dream a memory or not? Okay. But Anyway, it, it has a, it, there, uh, uh, the, uh, what is memory was beautifully explained by the guru there. So what he, ha uh, same thing happens to us in meditation also. Yeah. So what happens in memory, you see, we are closed, we have closed our eyes and we are, we are witnessing our mind. Yeah, true. Okay. 
so what is the wit what is the witness is the pure consciousness okay. in pure consciousness a lot of thoughts are coming and going coming and going these thoughts are only memories of the past okay events have happened in the past in the physical world and those events have left an impression in the mind those impressions when they become very deep they are called as vasanas okay. vasanas are carried to the next birth vasanas means the karana sharira mm-hmm. the causal body is where all the impressions are stored okay. so the impressions have got a manifest condition unmanifest condition okay. the unmanifest condition of the impressions is called as the sleep state Okay. the manifest condition of the impressions which you experience in your meditation they keep on coming and disturbing you sure. anybody who is a meditator will 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 understand what i am talking now so those are only impressions the object is not in front of you if the object was in front of you it will become recognition okay. so if if the object is not there but a memory is there of those objects that is what is called as impressions they are coming and going okay. now we as jiva there is no way to control that and there is a cosmic law which controls those impressions oh i see that is what is the our karma phalam this is what is called as this is under the control of ishwara okay that is why we say oh lord you control this impressions i have got nothing to do with it give me the teaching of the bhagavad gita and then you will remember that the lord is teaching that he has got two nature mm-hmm. he has got the formless he has mm-hmm. got the form the form the nature is what we experience in our as memory the formless nature is our own nature okay. that is what is called as sakshi okay. and you own up that sakshi learn to drop that impressions as coming and going don't get disturbed over it they their tendency is to come and go you cannot stop it no human being can stop his thoughts that's true these thoughts are always under the control of ishwara okay and that is why he is called as the jagat srishti sthiti laya karanam okay because he is the controller of all our thoughts okay and through the thoughts he gives us the karma phala okay and if a person doesn't have this knowledge of the spiritual study he will just keep on thinking that these impressions he he will not even know that there are impressions and there is a witness to those impressions yeah. so chandra you understood right yeah i understood thank you okay very very deep question yeah okay thank you thank you okay anybody else has anything else no one will go any shikaji yeah yeah uma yeah uh, shikaji on the same note so much i'm wondering I, whether i am yeah. contemplating or meditating because i sit down with the you know aham uh, asmi i say yeah. all this ah, mahavakya ah, yes. aham ah, asmi am um, yeah yeah i i start with that and then slowly i go into a you know i so i am confused am i meditating or am i contemplating okay there are see meditation and contemplation uh, are basically the same uh when you dwell on the uh scriptural thoughts it yes. is called as contemplation 
that means i contemplate on what i have heard yes. from the scriptures suppose you are you are uh, you are you are contemplating the contemplation leads to meditation ultimate meditation is what you are one with that witness that is the ultimate so while you are contemplating contemplating means let the thoughts be there the, these are called as vedantic meditation what chandra was asking me is the other thoughts which come and disturb us of the world those are all what is called as memory what you are doing is bringing a deliberate thought that aham brahma asmi i am that pure consciousness i am that pure being these are all deliberately you are bringing now this is what you are you the teaching you are trying to assimilate yes and when you assimilate that is what is called as contemplation okay so suppose you are you, you, these are deliberate thoughts yes no what what i was going to say uh, Shukaji, is that you know when i'm contemplating on what i've already studied and heard and all that sometimes something new comes maybe it's not really originating from my mind maybe it's something i heard but it sort of leads to another thought that i didn't think of before sitting down for this meditation what so type of correct. thought is it the thought of the world or is it the thought of the atma no it's still the thought of atma and you know the uh, consciousness the awareness very good of... then the, the, let it happen it is it is the it is the antaryami which is teaching you there Thank is you. there is the antaryami principle which is teaching you what you are that's all let it happen let it let it teach you okay shakil thank you very much okay anybody anything else okay if there are no other questions we'll stop today and then we'll continue next week with our study of the gita we'll do chapter 12 next week it will be again a summary presentation and uh, see these are all uh, things which help us in our study in our growth in our spiritual area and uh, the more we listen the better it is and slowly your doubts will get cleared and uh, as you grow you will find you are able to enjoy the life more and more and not get too ingrained with the uh, nitty gritties of life okay thank you and good night good night thank you shikaji thank you thank you shikaji good night good night thank you thank you good night shikaji okay good night